Welcome to the Forever Classic Podcast, the show seeking enlightenment through video games, films, and other geek culture. I'm Alex McCumbers. With me, as always, is Zachary Snyder. Zach, how are you today, bud? We're doing good today. And we also have with us our first guest on the show. Uh, we have with us Josh Pedroza, who is a, a good friend of mine and a fellow writer at Marooners Rock. He's one of the best that I know, and he makes my editing job way easier. Josh, how are you doing today, bud? How's it going, Alex? How you doing? Good, good. So today we have a really awesome show. We are coming up at the tail end of all the E3 excitement. I don't think it's quite died down yet. There's still a lot of... Uh, a lot of energy I can feel in the game industry. Stories are coming out of the woodwork. Little companies are starting to share their biggest things. And it's just uh, the, the next couple of years are looking to be some of the best in gaming. And like we have a tendency to say that, but this really looks like one of the best years in gaming. So uh, what did we talk about last week, Zach? So last week we touched on some more of the uh, anime that we wanted you to watch from uh, Awari no Seraph. And what was the one that you suggested, Alex? Iron Blooded Orphans was the big thing on my mind because I yes. just finished it from the last recording. Yes, yes. Oh man. Um, but we also talked a little bit about Monster Hunter Double Cross, uh, their announcement and how it's falling, and we touched base on a couple of little things pre E three at the end of last week's episode. Yeah, we had a lot of predictions and kind of what we were hoping for, and this week we're gonna kind of see like how those hopes and predictions fell if we were right, wrong, surprises. So if you are listening to us now for the first time, I do highly recommend jumping back to that pre-E3 discussion because it'll be interesting to see that kind of dichotomy between before the show and after the show. Oh, yeah, because we definitely hit some hit some predictions home and we missed a couple too, though. Yeah, um, even some of my like correct predictions had surprises like whittled in between them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but hey, it was it was a good show nonetheless. Oh, and Josh was there. Wrong. Yeah. I was there. I attended. Um, I did get to attend the Xbox press conference, which was nice, but I didn't get into Sony's, unfortunately. But yeah, I, I mean, we ended up watching it live. Um, there's this thing that I really like going to called the PlayStation Experience, where they basically just do a live stream uh, in a theater, and you get to share that with like all the real hardcore Sony fans and all the real mm -hmm. core like your gaming crowd is at this event. So there was probably 50 of us, and. Uh, Right. in the local theater and it was fun they gave out a, a code for some free goodies which had some dlc for uh, let it die i think they ended up giving us like ten dollars store credit is what it was last year i've yet to see exactly what that dollar amount is but there was also some uh, dlc and credits for paragon as well and even minecraft so there was some cool things they just kind of sprinkled in saying hey thanks for thanks for joining all right Actually, funny story, because uh, we tried getting into the Sony press conference. We all waited in the standby line. Uh, we waited outside for a good maybe two or three hours and didn't get in. Got sunburned, but didn't get into the, the conference. Oh, oh the line was even shitty. outside. Yeah, it was, uh, it was outside. We had, they had a standby line. So, like, because Microsoft let theirs in. I mean, granted, I got into, I was invited to Xbox, but they yeah, did let their standby in line. But Sony didn't. And actually, one, someone else had tweeted out, like, hey, you know, Sony, Microsoft let their standby line in. What about you guys? But <laughs> <laughs> but nope, they, still, they, didn't, they didn't budge. So after a while, we, everyone started leaving. So, yeah. Wow, that's unfortunate. Yeah. What, what's the saddest for me is that you wasted yeah. all that time. Yeah, what? I'm sorry. It, it sucks that you wasted all that time. You could have been doing yeah. something else or like playing a, a game at the show or something. It's just exactly. Yeah, I was, you know, I was, I'm based, I was basically on vacation for the same time too, and we wanted to explore like Hollywood Boulevard that day. But they're like, oh no, let's, let's try and get into Sony. And yeah, no, it didn't work. No. So yeah, right away we just came came back to our hotel and uh, just watched the watched the demo. Yeah, watched the conference. So. Right. Now, the funny thing about that conference is a lot of the streams being handled, I think it was IGN doing all the mixing. I'm not for certain. But whatever was streaming to, like, the, the major Twitch channels, that stream had audio issues in the first two trailer reveals. Yep. Luckily, it was for DLC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I think GameSpot had a we, – we, we watched the GameSpot uh, stream, and they had – I couldn't hear for a long time. It was just really low. And it was really funny because my favorite thing about going to the PlayStation experience is like hearing everybody's live reactions. Mm -hmm. For instance, when um, the pre-show came about and Undertale was announced coming physical for PS4 and Vita as well as on the PSN, they were like, 
yeah, here's this really cool shiny box. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then they're like, oh, yeah, and we're bringing DeVita, too. And I was like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and, like, nobody, everybody in the room just kind of, like, looked around. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the the crowd wasn't that enthusiastic from what I was, what I was seeing at Sony. I was noticing a lot of just people just being like some claps because everyone else was clapping, but not like enthusiastic claps for a lot. For a lot of there stuff. wasn't the hype guy that normally shows up to these things. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I'm disappointed because there's I'm always like, that one dude. Yeah, <laughs> I'm disappointed too because I wanted to be you know like in there because I, I, I love Sony. I'm a Sony guy, so I just would have been going crazy myself. Oh yeah, <laughs> you would have been the hype guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But back to that audio thing, like, it was great because there was no audio. The, the theater was dead silent, and everybody's like, uh... And then at one point, um, somebody in front of me is like, we should just make our own sound effects. <laughs> and, like, it was the best because people were mocking explosions. There was made-up dialogue. <laughs> at one point, there was a character drowning, and, of course, I'm sitting in the middle going... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the best, like, live game industry experiences in my life and last year was very similar like it was a lot of fun yeah, it was funny when i was in when i was in uh microsoft's conference like i granted so i'm not really a fan of the name xbox one x i think it's it's really silly i don't like it uh it's and gonna be thing, hard to market yeah and i was sitting next to people who were from microsoft like they're working i think with like the they're there they help with the with the community and uh, Microsoft. So, like, uh, when I said Microsoft uh, Xbox One X, I wanted to bust out laughing. <laughs> to them. But I'm like, no, I'm going to keep it to myself. <laughs> Just complete reserve. <laughs> hmm, yeah. <that's> nice. <laughs> it's an interesting name. But then, and then, and then I, I got your text message Xbox One X, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You were sitting next to the community people, and here I am, like, yeah. hilariously <laughs> cracking up. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Like, what was next? Is the PlayStation 4 station? Is that what we're getting next? <laughs> That's kind of brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I find clever about the Xbox One X is the fact that if you take the first letter out of each of those, it spells Xbox. Yeah. Yeah. So and I was like, I don't know if that was intentional, but it's clever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't know what else. I mean, I would have been found Xbox One Scorpio instead, but yeah. Oh, well. I would have too. Yeah. I mean, there was just so much going on, and it's not like it was as overwhelming as whenever the the even last year there was. It feels like more just big surprises. This year it was a bit more held back because I mm-hmm. think they wanted to uh, like make sure that the things they're hyping up are coming to a point where people want to buy it. Like a lot of mm-hmm. people will see Final Fantasy VII remake and think, you know, I really want that, but I'm not gonna go ahead and pre-order it now. Because that pre-order is just going to sit there for three or four years. Yeah. So uh-huh. it, I think E3 is finally coming around to the point that everybody is get, getting to the general consensus of we need to be talking about stuff that's coming out soon so the excitement can build and people can get it in their hands. And when the rubber meets the or the, when the rubber meets the road, so to speak, they shell out the cash and they actually make that purchase. Yep. Yeah, that's Which, important. I actually, because uh, I, I was reading a lot of uh, criticism about Last of Us 2 not being at Sony and I, for one, knew that wasn't going to happen. I knew they weren't going to show Last of Us Two because it's Naughty Dog. They come out with the games when when they want to. Uh, That's true. And I knew that we don't. I because when we saw our first trailer at the uh, the this was the PlayStation. What was it? The PlayStation Experience. I don't remember what that was called. It was the same presser that happened this year, but last year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, when we saw that. You know, it was great. But I knew from the start, like. There were, were still a couple of years from this from getting this game, so I was okay with not seeing anything. I was actually I actually would have been upset if we started seeing gameplay for it because I know Naughty Dog, they're perfectionists over there too. They would have mm-hmm. they would have they're, they're not going to rush this. So I wasn't mad about that, but some people were. So. Uh, to be honest, I kind of forgot about it. Yeah, and I'll get to that once we uh, start breaking down like our favorite things that happened. But yeah. Zach, what was some of the the highlights for you as somebody? who was kind of watching things after they happened. Like, cause you didn't watch any of the live streams, right? Um, I got to watch Nintendo with you guys in the discord. And I also got to watch, um, what was the very first one? Uh, EA. Yeah. Yes. I watched EA. EA. Uh, those are the two that I got to watch live. Cause right now we have an interesting setup for our discussions. We have Zach who is watching it as mostly a consumer somebody that's kind of a hobbyist when it comes to uh creating content which mostly focuses on our podcast and your streaming and then you have me who does it as a journalist 
and like I'm getting the press releases on top of everything that's going on. I'm usually watching stuff as they happen. And then we have Josh, who is also a journalist who was actually there. So I mean, we have a really interesting setup to really dive into some of this E3 stuff and get a good uh, different perspectives on the event. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm, for sure. But um, from what I saw, uh, I was really interested to see what they were going to do with uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Because mm-hmm. I got really hyped for the first one because I, I played an ungodly amount of hours of Star Wars Battlefront on the PlayStation 2. And then I was pretty disappointed by the new one that came out because I got it day one and I wasn't very happy with it. And I just never picked it back up. I was looking at it after they started adding Space Battle and like more flight. I just kind of left it be and decided to wait to see what they were going to do. When I heard the announcement of 2, I wanted to pay more attention and they... You know, they heard fan feedback. Joe Boyega's talk about, or his tweet about wanting to have a a campaign mode, which they Mm -hmm. touched base on, which was awesome. The campaign looks like it's going to be very cool and outside of the world of stuff. So it's not going to be a retelling. It'll be an original telling of something going on, you know, quote unquote, off camera from the main story. Which I find interesting because I really like original Star Wars stories, probably more than I do actual Star Wars stories. Yeah, it's just a huge universe. Mm-hmm. You just can you, you do anything you want, basically. Now, one of the favorite things for me that happened specifically with EA and Battlefront 2 is EA actually stepped up and said, hey, we didn't do that good the first time. Mm-hmm. And I really like how they phrased that. They're like, we heard the negative responses. We, we understand. We really wanted to get into this community and actually make something that's like super worthwhile. Because at the end of the day, the first Star Wars Battlefront had some of the most gorgeous graphics that I had seen in a long time. Like, it was excellent. It was very faithful to the movies, very faithful to the Star Wars universe as a whole. And, like, I always thought that while playing that game, yes, this is this is very bare bones, but this is the, the foundation for something awesome. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what we're getting, I think, with Battlefront 2. Yep. Yeah, I can't I can't dispute the graphics. It was it was great looking. Sounded great too. I oh yeah, I mean that's a dice. Any dice game is going to sound fantastic. So yeah. that's very true. I'm a firm believer that sequels in gaming tend to be better. Like you know, movies and you know sometimes like sequels aren't as good. But when it comes to game games, sequels tend to be better because the developers tend to listen to the community. They get feedback and they can implement implement all those details into their games. That's so I true. Think it will be uh, definitely better than the first one. And that's feedback outside of their focus groups, too. Like, whenever you get into a market that's buying millions of copies, a lot of those customers are going to take the time to say, hey, this is what I like, this is what I dislike. And because we're in the social media age, that's really easy. Yes. Oh, yeah. For sure. People can, or your community people, the people who are studying this data and the feedback can look at all these Let's Plays, these live streams, the um, there's just the tweets of any sort of Facebook comments. Like there's a lot of information coming in and it's really up to the developer to say, okay, let's take this information and kind of mold it and make it sort of fit our needs and their needs all at the same time. Yeah. And I like that. The, I agree with you on the point of, you know, sequels being better. I always think that first sequel is the biggest jump to be better. So whatever the two of everything is usually makes the biggest jump to be fantastic. And that's one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to Battlefront 2. Yeah, you look at some of the best games in history and like they tend to be sequels. Like you think of Mass Effect 2, Uncharted 2, Assassin's Creed 2, like Borderlands 2. All those games, they jumped up and made something great. That's the thing. And most people remember the second game a lot the most. That's true. Hey, Zelda hey, 2? Maybe not Zelda, Zelda 2. 2. Metal Maybe Gear Solid Two, Metal Gear Solid Two, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. oh, that's questionable for some people. <laughs> <laughs> the game that broke the E three show when the trailer was announced. Yeah, yeah. Two is two is a little weird in that respect, but that's a a whole nother tangent. So I'm excited. We, we, we might come back to some Metal Gear soon, Zach. I really like what we were discussing the other day about doing a full playthrough and you kind of educating me as we go. All right. Yeah. So we might come back to that if you guys are interested. Um. So as far as so we, we've covered kind of the, the the basics of kind of what we saw initially. Uh, Josh, what would you say the most exciting moment for you in the conference related to a particular game would be? Um, 
Well, I would maybe I'm biased because I love Sony, but uh, seeing Spider Man at Sony got me so excited. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm a first Spider Man is my favorite superhero. He always will be. So, and I knew we we're getting a game from Insomniac, so like I'm ex- I'm excited for it. Um, and I saw the demo, and I'm like, this is exactly what I want in a Spider Man game. It looks fantastic. To- yeah, I want to just be. I want you to feel like Spider Man, but I also want it to just be epic and scale. Like and they have like these very uncharted um, set pieces going on in the game, but it's very also very Arkham inspired. I can tell. So like that's the game I want. I knew, I knew Marvel needs a good uh, superhero game because DC got the Arkham games. Now Marvel may have Spider Man. So I'm I'm very excited for that. Seeing that sprout my childhood out basically. It's cool that a lot of these licenses and intellectual properties are being passed to studios that really are going to make the most out of them. Mm -hmm. So I think that Insomniac was kind of a perfect fit for Spider-Man. The safe route would have been Rocksteady, obviously. Yeah, of course. Of course. But But it's cool what Insomniac does with character-centric games. Like, a lot of their games focus on a single character or a pair of characters, and they kind of expand everything based on that character's, like, moveset. Yeah. And that's kind of a theme of their games. They can be silly but awesome at the exact same time. Like, look at Sunset Overdrive and Ratchet and Clank. Like, silly, but at the same time, awesome, and you're having a blast. And that's what Spider-Man is. He's one-liners, and he's, he's got awesome action at the same time, so... I think Insomniac's tone really fits Spider-Man, bro. I think this could very well be the best portrayal of Spider-Man outside of the comics that we've ever seen. Yeah. 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 I just want to see some old TV memes in this game. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's very... I was cool if they had, like, a 60s Spider-Man, like, uh, skin in there. I really hope there's plenty of costumes, because whenever I played the classic Spider-Man game on PS1 that was fairly well received yeah uh, it had i think 16 or 17 like awesome deep costumes stuff from the comics i had no idea of i didn't know who spider-man 2099 was <laughs> yeah yeah oh no there's so many <laughs> ran- so many different ones yeah i tell you what though he's cool as hell <laughs> yeah <laughs> i want to see a black a black suit spider-man in there because that's i mean i love the, the black suit spider-man it's like one of my favorite storylines so I, I just hope it's not a pre-order bonus we need to yeah. get out of that yeah i'm tired of it mm-hmm. very yeah, that was definitely my favorite uh, aspect of, of all the conferences. It just, just got me so excited. So Now, did you get to see the booth for the Spider-Man area? Because I know the booth was pretty impressive. Yes. It, uh, I didn't get to go and I didn't get to... Uh, I know I didn't get to go into the live demo. Uh, my, my friend did, and he said it's basically the exact exact same demo, just a little different uh, when they're playing it live. Uh, but the setup was awesome. It had Spider-Man. It had a, this thing of Spider-Man set up on a helicopter, and he's like, you know, like trying to bring it down and it was just really an awesome setup most of sony's like actual booth their setup wasn't fantastic uh the days gone had a really cool like uh setup to it um as well as detroit become human had really uh really cool uh, setup but yeah that's one of my favorite things about e3 is seeing the set design which is interesting probably for you zach since you've got the acting background oh yeah the uh nintendo had a very uh just awesome uh, set up too. I loved like just the and the energy in the room was great when you're when you're at when you're at Nintendo. So. Nintendo had an actually a pretty solid um, conference and yeah. just being at E3, they had a really good presence. I feel. Mm-hmm. Fair. I probably say they had the best press conference. I would say in terms of just games surprises. Uh, it was overall. dense. Yeah. Yeah. It was really dense. Yeah. I really liked the Nintendo stream on our side. Like getting to see it, they were really calm, casual about it, but it was just everything was exciting because it didn't give you time to uh, like settle back down from something before they gave yeah. you something else to get excited about. And of course, that's all pre-recorded and cut specifically for that. But I mean, I always like the Nintendo Direct videos. I kind of miss when they had multiple ones, though, because I feel like a couple years ago they had one or two. Like there was multiple videos. Maybe they're just blending together. Um, <laughs> but either way, N- Nintendo had some really good announcements, and uh, that'll definitely be one of the things I bring up here shortly. Uh, Zach, what was your favorite like drop dead moment of E3? My favorite drop dead moment, um... or like game you're looking most forward to, or just what? What's the central point of like your excitement right now? The central point of my excitement is probably one of the central points of yours as well, and it's going to be the Monster Hunter World announcement and. Yes. All like like we've been researching Monster Hunter World for 
since we heard it, but I touched base with you saying that I thought it was going to be some sort of like mobile companion something released because they had just copyrighted it like the day before E3, like put it in and got wind of it in the media. Oh, I didn't even hear about that. Like I just saw it happen as a complete surprise. Uh, there was rumors a while back that there was a PS4 Monster Hunter being announced and there was people in the Monster Hunter International Guild that I'm a part of on Facebook and there were several people that were saying, hey, you guys are going to drop dead. Like, this is going to be something specifically for you guys. We're not going to say what it is, but you're going to want to pay attention on the next couple days. Yeah, the monster and it was huge. Mm-hmm. It was definitely a huge reaction. I loved your reaction to it when you like well, you freaked out about it too, Alex. <laughs> I was at the PlayStation Experience. We was watching this event. The audio had just cut back, and the character walks in between the the vines, and he's got the iconic sword from the the cover art of the first release. And I'm like, oh my god, it's Monster Hunter. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit, this is happening. And it, like I, I'm feeling the the tingles in my body now. Like that was a huge moment for me. And there uh, around me, like we had some friends who kind of played Monster Hunter. But like I've been with this franchise since I found it in a convenience store for like fifteen dollars on the PS2. <laughs> like I have always been attached to this franchise. And the fact that they're finally doing some sort of like major evolution with a full ecosystem and just the way the monsters interact with each other and the player there's like grappling hooks and shit now you can trap monsters and in the environment the there's no loading screens like i can't i cannot capture in words how i feel about this game like i am beyond excited i cried like it happened and i cried it was the most intense like surprise epic feeling of my entire like gaming life i'm i'm sad i missed that initial release like hype from it because I was working but as soon as I had like my break it was probably like 10 or 11 at night I got to look down and my phone was just full of stuff from our friends you know I had Tanner, <laughs> Lauren, the guys back home everybody just like Monster Hunter World it's here there's a thing you guys are gonna be so happy it's coming to PS4 and Xbox One in early 2018 so probably March by next year we're gonna be uh having our hands on this game and I'm gonna stream the hell out of it oh and, like, yeah it's going to be a focal point for my streams and like I'm going to cover it in all aspects on uh, Marooner's Rock and I'm just beyond excited. Now, here's the weird part because I follow the community pretty closely. Um, we were kind of anticipating Monster Hunter Double Cross getting that global announcement for Switch and coming out of Japan, which it's going to come out here in the next couple months, I think, August or September. And a lot of people are anticipating that everybody get that game because it's 3DS cross compatible with the Switch. Everybody really wants something to play on the Switch right now because the releases are starting to die down. I mean, you've got Arms and Splatoon coming out this month, which is great. But uh, Monster Hunter, you can sink easily 100 hours into and not even like blink. I definitely have. Me, me Tanner, and uh, Travis all just playing around 3DS Wii U. And I didn't even get to play with you guys that much, and I probably put in 50, 60 hours per game by myself, just playing solo. <laughs> yeah, God, we were we had it down to a science. Like, we got to where we could just farm Rathalos and go through stuff. Now, the official, um, the official statement from Capcom is, we are not saying we're not doing it. So they're saying that they might do it later, but for now, they really want to focus the energy on Monster Hunter World and get that information out as quickly as possible. Yeah, I prefer it, honestly. Like, I would love to have seen the Double Cross and maybe World later. I think that would have been a great tie-in to get the Switch community in the 3DS, like, all of its games and hypes, like, rolling higher and higher. But And then World afterwards to let everybody in on this new train of hype going on. But this World announcement immediately taps into a whole new set of audiences, like, old and new alike, to give you mm -hmm. the action on your specific console and ready to go soon. Now I am under the impression and uh, we can say it here. I think we're going to get monster hunter double cross by the end of the year. Globally. I would almost bet money on it that it's going to happen. Um, it just makes sense that they would do something like that. And it normally takes three to four months for a monster hunter game to release in Japan and then release everywhere else. So I have a feeling that by Christmas we'll be able to play it on Switch. I also have a feeling that Monster Hunter World will be ported to the Switch eventually because I've seen the recent gameplay footage that was shown during a, a live stream today and I think it's doable on Switch. Yeah, 
You can see that. Yeah, uh, my friend, he uh, when he went to the demo, he says, yeah, like, like Monster Hunter has never, never been known just for having amazing graphics. That's not what they're about. I mean, yeah, right. they have good graphics still, but it's all about the gameplay and everything. And I think that the Switch would work, and the Switch is the perfect console for it to me because it's like the, uh, they could play with your friends, you know, you got a gaming session, everyone brings their brings it over with like make it a little local game together so i think switch is the perfect opportunity for it i really hope it does eventually come to switch but at the end of the day we're gonna get monster hunter on switch it's gonna happen yeah yeah like oh, yeah. don't leave it out of the portable market yet because that's where they've made millions yeah oh for sure it was nintendo that's the thing because i've never i've never played a monster hunter game because i've not really had a nintendo console since the gamecube or i haven't had a a DS either so like and I know Monster Hunter is a game I've, I've always liked to play I just never got the opportunity to so it's always been in a weird spot because as soon as as soon as it took off on PSP it's been stuck in in uh, handhelds for a long time it's a big big audience so actually when I was I was actually gonna I actually was gonna wait in line but then I actually had something else to do but I was waiting in line for the live demo for our Monster Hunter right uh, but then uh, my friend ended up doing it but I had to do something else, but as I'm waiting in line, I'm sitting next to two people who are developers at Boss Key Productions who uh, work who are, yeah, work on Lawbreakers. You know, Lawbreakers is a boss the wall action game, and there's these two guys, you know, working on that game, just playing Monster Hunter on their DS while waiting for waiting in line. I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> that is cool. I love it when developers and like community members really enjoy something else because yeah. we see on Twitter a lot that if a conference is happening, like I know whenever Xbox conference was up. Sony was like, hey, guys, uh, good luck. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. we're rooting for you, even yeah. though we're your competition. And I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you get when you see him get excited about games, I know, like, I can't remember who it was, but uh, I think the CEO, the head of uh, Xbox, he was, like, praising Uncharted 4 after it came out, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, because that's the thing. You just make, and I, I want to get to a point where no one argues which is better. Just enjoy all. Just enjoy the whole. Just enjoy them all. It's all fun. There's a... I don't understand, like... I get caught up in it just because I, I watch the industry happen as it happens, but I, I can't get caught up in the whole console wars thing because I've always played everything. And now that I'm a, an adult, that's way easier. Like when I was a teenager, you know, you pick one console and that's pretty much what you're stuck with. But yeah. now that I'm an adult, if I see something I like, I can save the money up and get what I need. And since I'm a journalist, having multiple consoles is a benefit for me because that means it just gives me more options to create content. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. Now, Josh, uh, what else did you see at E3? What was another like huge game for you? Uh, my, I, w- I w- actually I would say my 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 E3 game, my E3 best of E3 game would be Shadow of War. Uh, just because, uh, well, it's a game I've been looking forward to. I've been waiting. Uh, I knew Shadow of Mordor was a game that, as much as I loved it, I knew there was there was still more that needed to be had in that game. And I saw the potential, and it looks like that potential is being brought out in the Shadow of War, everything we've seen. Uh, and when I got to see, uh, I got to see a demo uh, at the Coliseum. They had Coliseum shows, panels going on, you know, outside of the, the big uh, show floor. And they had Troy Baker and I believe the other, another guy from Monolith, I believe his name is Michael uh, DePlatter. He's from Monolith as well. Mm-hmm. They're just discussing the game and they did a live demo and it was just a uh, great atmosphere, great fun. Troy Baker's really cool very charismatic person in, in real life uh and just the way the demo show like it basically basically each demo that's been shown that was shown in e3 was totally different from each one because that's part of the game no two playthroughs are really ever the same uh so i'm definitely excited about that the guy it looks epic in scale but just the nemesis system looks so diverse and like i said like my playthrough will be different from my friend's playthrough uh, yeah so and it was a really one funny thing that happened was Tally and the main character, who's voiced by Troy Baker, he just makes some badass epic line in the demo. And then Troy Baker looks down back at the audience with this cheesy smile, but like, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, but it looks good. And the cool thing, I think my biggest, my best surprise I had at the end of that was they, because the, uh, the guy playing the demo, he actually died. He didn't beat the final, didn't beat the final boss in the siege. Uh. And, I guess what happens is when you die in the, you die in the middle of a siege, like the you know like you don't get to replay the siege again. Well, you can later on, but the time moves forward. So people that the siege, like people that didn't get defeated, they they level up, they get stronger. Now you got to now you got to build an even bigger army to just to defeat them. I really like the nemesis system and concept. I can't say I've played it, yeah. 
because I never picked up Shadow of War. I might now because, you know, Shadow of War looks excellent. Yes. But, it's um, a fun game. Yeah. It, it, it was came out of left field, too, because everybody saw it and we're like, oh, that looks cool. You know, it's a Lord of the Rings Assassin's Creed action style game mm-hmm. with this neat little system attached to it. And then it came out and people are like, holy crap, this is great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember playing it and I love the combat, too. The combat's so much fun. Yeah. I was definitely, there was, a, there was rumors that apparently Warner Brothers had paid off reviewers to, give this game good reviews but thing really they didn't need to because it was just was a fantastic game in general so huh. yeah see I, I didn't hear that story but you hear that sometimes with specific games like yeah. pr people trying to push higher scores and yeah. things like that we even run into that every now and again with yeah. uh, some of the indie developers but usually that gets shut down quick <laughs> yes very because <laughs> there's no. like very little tolerance for that yeah, all it takes is one one person to spill the beans on that, and then they're they're screwed. There was an issue with that with um, an indie game. That, it was like a zombie shooter mobile game that came to Steam, and I mean it looks horrible. But the <laughs> developers are like, if you do not grade us well, this next project we're doing is going to be great, and you won't get it. And I'm like, fuck you guys. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> like that's that's not going to fly. And I really wanted to break that story. And I didn't get to do it, and somebody else did, and it went viral. And I'm like, damn it. I could have been that guy. Yeah. Oh, man. Because, like, I could feel that the entire gaming world had gotten this message, and everybody was just kind of like, ah. They were di- digesting on what exactly to do with it. And then finally, I think Destructoid or somebody broke the story, and it became a big deal. And, like, what what, like, what they expect? Like, because it's not like they made you sign a contract where you couldn't say anything about that. So, like, this is... 27 this is the 2017 where everything it just gets leaked like that right um, so i don't know the why best thing think. the best thing you could do as a representative of a game is just to be honest don't feed us bullshit uh which we might actually get into with e3 as a whole because e3 has kind of been that thing that like overhypes games uh for instance evil within had a very very cool um e3 presence but then you play the game and it, that, that presence was there. That was a really cool intro scene. But once that intro scene was over with and you started getting to like the later parts of the game, that uh, level of quality seemed to dip. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. okay, well, E3 definitely shows things in the absolute best light that it can. And we need to make sure that we take everything with a little bit of salt and say, you know what? It might not release how it's looking, especially some of these more cinematic games like the Assassin's Creed's and your big stuff and all that. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, development that goes into these, and it's not necessarily going to meet the expectations of the players, so to speak. Yeah, I actually mentioned that in my. Uh, I remember as soon as the Spider-Man demo came out, I right away wrote up a post about it, and I did say in my post like it looked visually looks great, but I'm going to be skeptical because it's an e, it's an E3 demo, so because I don't I just I'm not going to expect it to game I'm not going to expect the game to look as gorgeous as that as that demo was so exactly and you also get even screenshots being doctored up a little bit in like mm-hmm. photoshop or the or rendering a specific section of the game with your game engine and then taking a screenshot yeah i think watchdog has been the most notorious in that in recent that memory yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah recent yeah. memory watchdog has been a big one and it continues i don't think it's as big as a problem now because everybody has access to screen capture technology in their consoles yeah so if like it's faked people are gonna know mm-hmm. did you notice the uh have you had like, did, you, did you see the uh did you watch the anthem uh demo yes the one at the xbox thing uh yes yeah at the xbox um because i don't know have you ever did you ever watched the division demo with eighty three uh like a few years ago i don't know if you ever watched that i think i know where you're going with this yeah, yeah it looks i was watching the anthem demo the way they were talking um, like this is just like the division demo. That was like my exact reaction to it. And they did say that the division was had a heavy influence on Anthem. So <laughs> I just now that's kind of your genre too, Zach, because you're really digging Destiny, and you have for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I I dig playing Destiny for a while, but like once I hit the mind numbing like final end of stuff, like I it was just grind and play the same thing over and over, which is the reason most of. Uh, me and my group of gaming guys just kind of fell off of it. You know, Lauren yeah, loves it though. Me too. <laughs> Lauren still plays it because that's just that's exactly up her alley because she's a huge avid Halo fan and shooting mm-hmm. aliens falls right into Destiny perfect for her. Now, um, did you get to play the Division at all, Zach? Yeah, I, I actually own it. We played quite a bit of it. 
we shot all the way through like we grinded up as much gear as we could we played through all the stories all the hard we got into like really deep into the dark zone but it just after a while like doing anything in dark zone pvp together just got too monotonous to continue doing it's very right. sick. It, got, it got to a point where you felt like you're doing the same thing over and over again. I remember playing the demo and my friend and I having some of the best call we've ever had going in the dark zone because just like we, we end up creating a huge bounty on ourselves and we were being chased by the entire freaking server. <laughs> so, like, that was that, that was a good time. But like you said, it just got grindy. Same with Destiny. But I'm wondering if that's what Anthem is trying to basically take the potential of both those games. And that's when that's what Anthem's going to be. That's been my um, my main point with these two games is this is a genre being built. I don't know what I think I'm going to call it loot based first person shooter. I think that's what it is. I'm not real sure. But eventually somebody's going to nail that. And it's either going to be at least at the moment, it's either going to be Destiny 2 or Anthem. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it'll probably end up being Anthem just because it looks it's by Bioware. I mean, there's a big world building team going into this game. So the world itself might be interesting. And that's been the major drawback with uh, both Division and Destiny is that your environments, while they look really nice, are in fact very small whenever you get to the square footage and what's yeah. actually in them. Or Borderlands 3, maybe. Right. So yeah, because yeah, Borderlands 3 could fit that as well. Because when I first saw Destiny, I was thinking it was basically Borderlands and Halo had a beautiful love child, and that's what Destiny was going to be. <laughs> and I mean, Destiny's okay. It's got a great mechanic set to oh, it. Yeah. Like, shooting feels awesome. It's probably some of the best I've ever played, honestly, in terms of shooting. Uh, yeah, and I, I got back into it recently. Like, I downloaded, like, the Taken King whole, like, uh, mm -hmm. whole uh, edition, and I, I got into it, and like they've definitely improved it a lot, and which makes me excited for Destiny Two more because I definitely feel like they just took all the feedback and are implementing that so much. Yeah. I have a lot of hope for Destiny Two. I'm I'm ready, I'm ready to play it. Like uh, play uh, our buddies, uh, Alec, not Alex, our buddies, uh, Eric and uh, Tanner. They actually just yeah. picked up the whole Taken King collection and have been playing with Lauren. So we've all slowly touched base on getting back into it to refresh yeah, I, for Destiny Two as well. Yeah, I played. Uh, I had I had an appointment actually set up at Act at the Activision booth to play Destiny Two, but I was disappointed when I got there because um, it was only just a PvP multiplayer match. That's all it was, uh, which disappointed me because I wanted to play a strike because that's the true Destiny experience. Multiplayer is fun, don't get me wrong, from Destiny, mm -hmm. but it's all about fighting you know waves of enemies. That's that's the real fun of Destiny. So I wish I would have gotten a chance to do that, but. Fortunately, I didn't. So, but you did get your hands on the multiplayer. I did get my hands on the multiplayer, and it still feels very Destiny. Which, at the same time, it's that's what I expected because don't fix what's not broken. The that's true. Is fantastic. Why not break it? But the thing is, like the multiplayer, I feel like is still going to feel like the multiplayer because that's it's it's just PvP. I, but I think what Destiny Two is doing, it's making it's still going to look this kind of look very similar and play very similar but it's just the world they build that's what the true sequelness i think will show if that if that's if that's really what they're promising so and i think that's what the game particularly was really lacking in a lot of your lore was pretty cool and had some interesting symbolism and aspects of it it just mm -hmm. wasn't presented in game it was all on websites and wikipedia style things yeah yeah and i'm not gonna go off my console and go on the internet like come on <laughs> like we we honestly like researched the shit out of like all the grimoire cards and we still couldn't figure out like yeah who the hell's the traveler and why well, are not the traveler well hey who the traveler is and b like who the fuck's a stranger like why yeah. are they actually here why don't they have a ghost and who are these other people they're talking to yeah who's the stranger i don't know <laughs> yeah apparently i brought bungee i can't remember who the uh i don't know what i think it was the light i don't know or some there's some type of aspect in destiny some type of character lore but apparently Bungie didn't even know either what something was oh nice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just That's threw it in there plus. uh <laughs> we threw in nouns and just capitalized them what's yeah, it basically <laughs> I have what no do you idea. gotta do shoot, shoot him in the face okay <laughs> fair enough got it destiny <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah because now I, 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 yeah sorry go ahead no you're fine i just when i play destiny i want to like know why the hell i'm shooting everything yeah, just when I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I didn't get that in the first game. I was just like, oh, loot and XP. That's all I saw. See, that's what we did. And, and I, then, like, Lauren brought up playing a lot of it for me. She was like, 
So are we good guys or bad guys? Because we don't remember, like, in character <laughs> lore, what the fuck we did before. Like, why is this one guy that they tried to wake up to be a guardian say, no, I don't want to be a guardian and put me back to sleep? Like, I don't know. Like, are we second-rate citizens? Because we don't go down into that city at all with the humans. Like, we stay up here in this tower by ourselves. There are so many questions. <laughs> and they're, like, real vague, open-ended questions that really can't be answered. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. At least answer a couple of them for me. Put me in a ballpark. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's always been a destiny is um, there. There's a couple different ways that I see games is I see games that are very mechanically gameplay focused. And I see games that are like more experience and narrative driven focused and destiny and arms and those sort of games fall into that mechanic based thing, which is where Tetris and stuff falls. Yeah. But um, games that really handle this well is fighting games, which is something I've always been a big fan of. And we had uh, a bit of a hint to um, what Arc System Works is doing, and they were basically given the Dragon Ball Z license, and they were given almost complete freedom to do what they want. Now, what happened was Dragon Ball Fighter Z, and it is the most awesome-looking fighting game I've seen in a long time. It's my my friend probably said he, and I agree with him. He said it's the best game he played. Actually, I think it's a play Shadow of War, but I did play Dragon Ball Fighter Z, and it was fantastic, and I don't even—I don't even like fighting games, and that right. was fantastic. This is the game like that Dragon Ball Z fans have really kind of envisioned yeah. for years. Mm -hmm. Now, now, what makes it so special? Because I haven't got to see anything on Dragon Ball Z uh, Fighter, but I've seen you know tons and tons of like Budokai like fighting style yeah. like well, fighting game. It's back to basics, basically. It's not doing because the 3D fighting that doesn't work as much as you want to want it to work. It doesn't. No one likes that. Everyone likes the, the straight up 2 2D fighting game, fighting game style, and it's just it's just fun. Like it's uh, the combos you can put together. It's just I we had a blast with it. My friend and I, I think we were super loud when we were playing because we just have we we're just having a blast. So I, I feel like most people were in that mode of it's just it's a very exciting, well presented Dragon Ball Z experience. Now, Zach, are you familiar with Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue? Uh, yes, because Tanner played both of those extensively, and I think he lent me Blaze Blue to stream at some point. It's that team. Okay. Okay. So imagine really crisp 2D animation that actually has blended in 3D models and characters and stuff. Yeah, it's very similar to the art style of the most recent Guilty Gear game, which is called Zerd X R D. I, I don't know. It's yeah, it's the yeah. newest one. It looks like that, but it's got really sharp lines, really sharp visuals. As far as like characters, we've only seen Frieza, Majin Buu, Cell, uh, Teen Gohan, Vegeta, and Goku. Yeah, it was a small roster. I don't know if that's gonna yeah. be the final. It's a three v three fighter too. I don't. Yeah. Now, oh. Josh, do you know if um you can play one v one or two v two? Uh, or is we, it stuck at 3v3? I do not know. We only got to play 3v3, but I, I hope you could do one-on-one. -on -one. That would be... That would make, I hope that so. Make sense. Yeah. Because while I always have enjoyed, like, Marvel vs. Capcom's fighting style with the 3v3 swap in, swap out, you yeah, can bring yeah. them in for um, temporary attacks, you can straight up switch characters, but I, I am also a big fan of the one-on-one -on -one Street Fighter situation. Yeah. And considering Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear have always been kind of crammed full of modes, I kind of anticipate that to be available, but I'm not certain. I feel like it in this. It's feel like it's almost like you should have it basically in a right in a fighting game at this day and age. So well, we'll see. And it's also interesting that Dragon Ball Super is reaching its peak in popularity right now. Like yes. some crazy stuff is happening in the show. I'm caught up. Zach is caught up. Are you caught up? I did, I'm, I'm, I'm not. No. I'm not. Okay. Well, Dragon Ball Super is insane there's a giant tournament coming up soon it's bringing back characters that we didn't think were ever going to be useful again so krillin and tn are viable master roshi's in this tournament like things are nuts and it's yeah. interesting because dragon ball fighter z only had a single reference to dragon ball super and that was when frieza turned into golden frieza yeah that's a that's frieza's thing though with the new uh, dragon ball universe is he's like well fuck it like i want to train like, I want to get a little bit better this time. I don't have a reason to normally. He goes Golden Frieza. <laughs> and now, yeah, like... And the, his whole motivation is he's been stewing in hell, tortured, wanting to kill Goku, and mentally killing Goku in his head. And that's, like, trained his energy consumption or something. <laughs> yeah, and that's... that's um, That brought him up to a higher level of Golden, too. Because he was Golden before they sent him to hell this last time. Oh, right, 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 yeah. 
Um, but then, either way, um, that's the only Dragon Ball Super reference in this game so far. And I'm, I'll be interested to see like if they take things from Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Super. Fuck it, bring GT in. Uh, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned GT at all because I think that Super is going to start incorporating aspects of GT into canon, and that would make it perfectly fine because GT is kind of not canon. Uh, right, it's but, an act. But Bulma and Vegeta just had a daughter. Yep. So there's one connection in. And uh, the crazy Saiyan girl from Universe 6, I think it uh -huh. is, that turned into basically the fucking female Broly. Yeah. So <laughs> they basically made an homage to those movies without tying in Broly. Right. But, I mean, she could have that weird power because she also went Super Saiyan without being angry or pissed off. She was sad and, like, distraught and turned into yeah. this fucking Broly monster Saiyan. Yeah, I really hope they incorporate some of those new Dragon Ball Super characters. Like, Trunks? Future Trunks is amazing in Dragon Ball Super. He could be in this game. Uh, they could bring back some of the custom weird characters that we've seen over the years in the Dragon Ball franchise. Oh, yeah. Like, there's there's a lot of possibilities. And Guilty Gear uh, Arc System Works in general have kind of been known for having pretty large character rosters of about 30, 40 characters. So I assume that they'll pull a lot of really interesting things. I, I want to know how transformation works is my biggest question right now. I mean, I would predict that it would be some sort of stamina bar, like power bar, like you build up through your fight and just blast into it. But Now, do you have any insight on that, Josh, since you actually got to see it in action? Um, not too much. I'm, I'm not really like I've never really played much of the Dragon Ball games, so I don't really have like a much of a. I don't, I don't really have a strong opinion on the, on the Dragon Ball game, so like I can't really That's say true. much on, on it. I can just say it was fun. Which is going to be cool because that's going to bring in your fighting game crowd and people exactly, like you. Yeah. Exactly. Me, I'm not a big fighting game person, but I had a blast playing it. So, like, it's more, it'd be more accessible to more people. So Now, do you watch a lot of anime, Josh? Not too much, no. I've always wanted to get into it. I just never did. And I didn't, I just, I, I mean, I know you can get into anime anytime you want. I just never have yet, so... I know we've done a, a couple discussions on a couple series here just because me and Zach watch a lot of Crunchyroll. So we're normally watching mm -hmm. uh, things that are new, things that are exciting in Japan. I've always, what I do want to get into is I've told it's fantastic is One Man Punch. <laughs> oh, One Punch Man. Yeah. One Punch Man. One yeah, Punch I've... Man is excellent. It's it, yeah. currently the season's like 12 episodes long or 13. So it's a good like one off, sit down, watch it. Uh, you'll have fun. It's amazing animation. Yeah, yeah, and the manga of that is still going, so there's definitely going to be probably a season two with as much reception as it received. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. They actually made an official announcement, I think, a couple months back that, yeah, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking on official announcements, Alex, they just officially announced uh, season three of Attack on Titan as well. Yeah, and it's coming early, like 2018 or mid-2018, yeah? Yeah, early. That, that's awesome, because I know a lot of people waited for that second season. Which I didn't. I haven't watched yet. I've just been caught up in the manga. Not as far as you have, but the last time I read it, I'm caught up. I think to at least the end of season two, maybe even the end of season three. Here's my like one spoiler I'm gonna throw out to it, but not spoiler of what goes on with it. So if anybody listening or listening later doesn't want to hear it, zoom up like 15 seconds. Season three is going to include where they finally get to Aaron's old house and get to see what's in the basement. Ooh. So it's gonna jump that far ahead. And keep Maybe going. I do need to watch season two. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think Dragon Ball Fighters is, again, another one of these interesting examples of the right developer being given the right property, just like mm -hmm. Spider Man. Now, Zach, uh, you were pretty into Destiny 2, obviously, which we kind of talked over. What else are you looking forward to? Um, with Destiny, one of the big things that I saw as a drawback in the first one, um, aside from its like scattered lore, was its play wasn't so much of a great story of like how why am i doing this in the moment and going forward like they had a brief like motivation like you know we got to stop this or they're going to kill these people okay yeah cool let's do it but with like the new trailers and some of the gameplay you get to see the uh the seamless shift from cinematic into play well almost seamless <laughs> and yeah I'm going to relate that again to Metal Gear Solid 4 is one of the better things that I've seen. You can just be walking and then all of a sudden you see like the black bars drop in and you notice you're in a cutscene now. Yeah. Or you come like you realize that that black bar just went away and your HUD came back up. It's time to fucking run because, you know, yeah. it's time to do stuff. And I like seeing that in the Destiny. That was very present in Uncharted 4. Have you played Uncharted 4, Zach? I didn't get to play 4. Uh, that's oh. the only one I haven't got to play yet. 
that is the perfect example of like a seamless transition from cutscene to gameplay, and I definitely saw that a lot in Spider Man as well. Ooh, hmm. That makes me yeah. more excited for Spider Man now too. Yeah, it is very because that's in the in the demo we saw him like you know like in a cutscene, and I don't know where like you don't realize, and I'm watching the demo, I'm like, oh my crap, the HUD just came back on, boom, he has to start going now. So. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. I did notice that. Yeah, a lot of games are starting to do that. Like, they're rendering their cutscenes in almost the same engine. Yeah, it basically makes it feel like one seamless uh, experience. And that's what I like about it. So, Because you'll see a lot of, like, early PS1 games, especially RPGs, they'll be your gameplay, and then your cutscenes look completely different. And it's, like, a completely different project. So it's cool that games are starting to, like, break that disconnect because at the end of the day yes these cutscenes are really cool and they're some of my favorite moments in games especially like on final fantasy 9 and all the different rpgs i've played over the years but it 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 has been a definite disconnect it's like okay here's a cutscene. i'm in a different world now whether this is a heightened fantasy or a heightened imaginary uh experience but it is separate Mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting to see that blend together yeah Definitely. I'd loved I'd loved playing like Uncharted Four and like I'm in the middle of an awesome set piece and like some of the more scripted events, they just blended in so well with everything you did as a player too. So yeah. Now something that I'm not really a big fan of, um, that's been a trend for a couple different games and it kind of has brought back the adventure genre is the fact that some of these cutscenes are in fact playable now. Um yeah. I call them interactive films is the only real word that i have for it but they're essentially that's it's games with a lot of quick time events and one of the biggest projects we've seen uh helming this at the moment is detroit become human which is something you had listed that you wanted to bring up zach yeah just from the way the game looked in the trailers i got really excited about seeing this like seamless flow uh that i've gotten used to from you know like telltale games like it gives you the the like countdown timer of this is how long you've got to make your choice while you're going through mm-hmm. stuff in the action to keep it with this nice flow of story before it makes a choice for you and it continues on the story anyway. Uh, and with the Detroit Become Human, everything looks really sleek. Like your picks, like uh, you can, I don't know how to explain it really well, except for it looks like it's going to flow nice, smooth from your choice without missing any kind of beat or like resetting up the scene uh, in like heavy rain. I loved heavy rain, uh, but some of it got a little jarry depending on your choice in the situation. That's true. Nothing too crazy, but it was enough that I didn't favor like those specific instances because of it. But this one looks like it's just going to be really seamless without like changing the tone a hundred percent, just choice to choice. Now, personally, I don't get into this style of gameplay very much because at the end of the day, I'm always like, Oh, I just want to like, I want to be involved. I want to actually do what's happening, right? But even um, Until Dawn, which is another good example of this genre, I thought was kind of fun. Like, the, just sitting down for a weekend or an evening or a couple evenings in a row with, like, uh, a couple people on the couch and you're, like, engaged in this experience and everybody's trying to make decisions at once and we mm-hmm. kind of come to a consensus. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanna, yeah like, I, the one thing I'm worried about, though, for... Detroit, um, and I and I do I believe it looks fantastic, and it looks like it might have. I, I love the setting; it's very uh, um, like Blade Runner ish. I feel like in terms of like yeah, and, yeah. Uh, one of the things is uh, what, what's the game? Got some cyberpunk. Yeah, and Deus Ex. I was thinking of too. Deus Ex. Yeah, but the one thing I'm worried about though yep. is the main actor playing the main character because I've uh, I've only seen this dude. Uh, my parents watch Grey's Anatomy, and I don't think he's that good of an mm-hmm. actor. And he's playing. He's playing. He's, it's his own face. It's his own facial animations too. So, and I'm worried about that because I don't think he's that good of an actor. But you know, I could be wrong. It could just be something different. He could surprise us. Yeah. Um. There's another game too, and the the title is escaping me. But it's it's a an interactive experience where your your player and it might be Detroit Become Human actually, where your players sitting on the couch at home can join a room on their cell phones and help vote on decisions. Oh. oh. And, I, okay. and I don't know if it's this. But it might be. I haven't heard about that, no. I I haven't either. I want to hear more about that, whatever you're talking about, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, it was in either the Xbox One or the... It might have been in the Xbox stream, actually. But it was a very player-driven choice. It was awesome to stream, because then you have people in the stream making decisions and helping you out. So I don't know. Like It it looked like an interesting concept, because that's what people do. Like You rent this game. Or the price should be low enough to... I don't think it should be a full $60 game. Yeah, no. no. But um, 
it, it's one of those things you just pick up and enjoy with people around you. It can be fun by yourself. But the most fun I've ever had with any sort of choice-driven narrative game has been with somebody else sitting either in, in the co-pilot seat or like a family hanging out on the couch, kind of like a movie. Like, let's all get yeah. together and watch a movie and interact with each other while it's happening. Makes yeah. a good date night. <laughs> yeah, it makes a perfect yeah, just, like, night. Make choices together. So, <laughs> my friends uh, Tyler and Becca, who Zach knows because we went to school together, um, they—that's one of their regular date nights. Is they'll play some of these narrative-based games. They really enjoyed going to different options of uh, uh, Until Dawn and trying to like keep people alive or killing off characters they hated. Like, yeah, <laughs> they really enjoyed it. I mean, I mean, I'm excited to see what Telltale does next because, like, one thing I'm just waiting for them just to like. I actually met a guy from Telltale when I was waiting at the standby line, uh, and he couldn't really give me any more information. But like, I asked him, like, "Are we getting Borderlands season two, please?" Because that's <laughs> the best thing you guys have done. And the guy looked at me, he's like, "I can't answer any of those questions." I'm like, "All right, fair enough." <laughs> no, I mean, good I, point. I want a Borderlands yeah. season two. That yeah, was that really was- good. I think it's the best one they've done, probably. Is well. That's what everybody says. I really wish that whatever engine Telltale is working on, I wish they would scrap it and upgrade it, because I'm tired yes. of it. Yes. It it's looks so buggy. dated. The models just kind of look awkward. Um, mm-hmm. The guys who are making Life is Strange now, the new team, for the sequel, they might be onto something, because they shared what sort of technology they're using, and it looks like an evolved form of what Telltale has been using. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe they can sell that to Telltale or Telltale can take what they're doing and kind of build off of it to make something that's a little more modern. Because I, yeah, I used to think that the Telltale games, like, oh, I thought maybe it looks like that because, you know, oh, there's the con, there's the so many different shifts in like, uh, like the uh, story base and there's so many decisions you can make. But then I'm playing a game like Witcher 3, which is, you know, a full AAA title game that has more choices in it than a, than a telltale game right so, well, yeah. and it's gorgeous so, yeah so there's no excuse anymore for me well, until dawn another one example fantastic yeah. looking game and it has many choices so telltale needs to basically yeah, get a better engine and they don't have excuses anymore and right now the problem with telltale is is they're paying the bills with all these license acquisitions because they're yeah. doing guardians of the galaxy they did batman they did minecraft like that's going to feed their team but we really need them to step up their game otherwise they're going to fade into uh, obscurity and all your major fans are going to be lost it's those licenses that, that sell those games too because like they could just come out they could just come out with their own original story but it's those licensed stories that everyone's like oh yes like batman i want to play some batman and everything yeah oh i like batman oh i yeah. like rocket raccoon yeah game of thrones was another uh that was another one mm-hmm. it was uh it was okay it was i think in terms of the narrative and tell your decisions that matter that's probably the best one they've done i definitely feel like cause my friend we had two completely different endings when we played huh. that so that was a, that was a fun time but it was definitely disappointing of all of them i would say but yeah well one of the things too is um like seven days to die when they came to their uh, console side Fun Pimps partnered with uh, Telltale, so Telltale's mm-hmm. doing you know that zombie crafting horde survival game as well. Yeah, yeah, they did the publishing for that, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they they put some of the funding into it, but that was honestly a really poor port, and yeah. it was kind of a stain on their resume <laughs> for the <laughs> longest time. I mean, people <laughs> still play it and enjoy it. I know plenty of people who are playing it, and I'm just like, no, please, please. Just pick up PC games. There's like a billion of these that are way better. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> honestly, I'm I'm still in the camp of playing it, but it's because the PC port or the PC version of it's got so much random shit in it now that it just yeah, it's actually been supported and updated and all that. Another uh, interactive game that I would I would, I, I would call it interactive story because there is still gameplay to be had is the Call of Cthulhu that I got to see a demo of. Oh, how was that? It was uh, it's interesting. It's it's from Cyanide and like it's basically like an interactive of RPG. I would say, like I said, you don't um, like all your skills you have in the game are detective based. There's no like you know you're not a fighter. You're not fighting off these monsters. You have to hide from them or you're dead. And um, which makes sense given the story it's based off yeah, of. Exactly. Yeah, they're very Lovecraftian. Um, and it's cool because over the game uh, you develop phobias. Actually, I, I, yeah, you develop phobias. Um, and one in the demo we saw, um, and again, I don't know how diverse these phobias will become in, in the actual game, but he, they, they jump forward in time in the game and he had developed claustrophobia. And it depends on all the actions, all the stuff that you do, all the stuff that you find has an impact on your character. You can either go insane, so you you need information, but too much will make you like lose your 
sense of reality in the game, which is pretty interesting. That's cool. Yeah, but in the class, a lot of Cthulhu-based games have played with this insanity aspect, so it'll be cool yeah. to see how this turns out. Yeah, I, Bloodborne did that too. Oh, yeah. I, I love the the uh, playing with psychological so, aspects in games. It's that, interactive. Yeah, yeah. You you get the especially when you talking about the Call of Cthulhu coming up. That sounds really good. Like you having all the mm -hmm. diversity and just depending on your choices. Some of the yeah. tabletops we played. I played a. Uh, this one called Dead Rain, where as you went through, like depending on how you played on the, in, you know, your own story, your own way, you could develop, you know, having like a super syndrome because you always jumped into the fight to save your friends. Now, like, unless you're doing that, like you'll take penalties or you'll get buffs or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you got scared of one type of zombie because of a tra traumatic experience. Now, every time you see it, you have to make sure that, you know, you either pass this will save or flee in terror or just freeze or pass out and then mm -hmm. that's more shit on your plate yeah when he developed claustrophobia he like in the demo he had to hide from this one monster but because he had claustrophobia he was he was in this closet so it's you know tight you know and it's dark and i guess in the game you can hear his heartbeat going and it gets faster and faster and the longer he stays in there he'll have a heart attack Oh, oh so like, shit! Yeah, so he he had to find a way to only be in there for a little bit and find somewhere else because he couldn't handle being in that closet for so long. That could be cool because I'm not a real big fan of horror games where you can't fight back. I've never been a big fan of Amnesia. Them. I don't like Outlast that much, but I've always found the setup interesting. So this might be a see, game that I actually enjoy. See, I kind of disagree with you on that because for me, a good horror game is one that makes you feel like a little bitch. So oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying then because then you can't when you play like that's why Dead Space 3 was disappointing to me because you're just a total badass at oh the first the Dead Space game. for sure is way better but I think the first yeah. Dead Space is a good mix of that horror action you can do things but like yeah. you're not super good at it yeah Resident Evil 7 would... did it the best here recently yes very yeah so I definitely think if you can't fight back that makes it legitly terrifying look at Alien Isolation the Xenomorph is can kill you instantly so that you right. have to avoid a xenomorph so which makes sense because it's a freaking xenomorph <laughs> yeah which i find it gets old a little bit quick because i would always run up and try to figure out what the xenomorph was doing and i'd be caught by surprise or whatever and then you just start over so it's just a big waste of time <laughs> yeah i'm, I'm more yeah, into atmospheric like symbolism fear yeah. which is really popular mm -hmm. in silent hill and even evil within had it pretty well but definitely Call of Cthulhu, I think you might be interested because like it takes that aspect that you may not like, but adding the whole RPG system inside of it too, and like how you develop phobia. So like it makes you like understand why your character is not doing something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and that's, yeah, I think it's definitely interesting. This is what's interesting to me, Josh, is because you get to see some of these smaller releases that may have flown under the radar for a lot of us. Uh, vampire, another one I, that I wrote up about. Yeah, you got to um, play vampire. Uh, is a vampire vampire? Vampire, vampire, I don't know. Yeah, I got, but again, it was a live demo. We didn't, we didn't get to play it as well, but um, that's supposed to be released later this year. They had the very interesting uh, mechanic of that you're a vampire and you need blood to basically, you know, stay alive and get, get more powerful. And the only way you can do that is by feeding on citizens, but each citizen will have their own story to them. So it's like, there's a moral dilemma, but at the same time, it does affect the environment and the district that you kill citizens in. And that's also an action RPG, true, right? Yeah, because the uh, combat was very bloodborne, bloodborne I noticed, which I'm completely okay with. Well, yeah, um, for sure. That was one of my favorite games ever. Yeah, yeah. so I definitely, it's definitely cool, because when I, when I think of a game where you just, like, when you need citizens, I think, have you ever played Prototype before? Prototype? Yeah. Uh, oh, the one where you play as Alex Mercer? Alex Mercer, yeah. And that game, it's very similar to that Hulk game. Yeah, mm, it's the same developers, yeah. Oh. So, but in that, in that game, you needed, you just needed to, you just consumed every random citizen that you found and you didn't give two shits about any of them. Well, yeah, they were, they were a resource. They were yeah, like, exactly. yeah. So in this game, it's like, yes, their blood is a resource, but guess what? Like, it's going to have an impact on who you kill. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, definitely interesting. Uh, definitely a very interesting aspect that I want to see brought in so have you seen that game yet zach uh the vampire yeah um only bits and pieces nothing like to give me any kind of scope of it but it sounds good like if it's gonna look bloodborne -y and play with the uh i really like cause and effect trees in games or yeah. just anything yeah. like if you do this like it's going to affect all of your actions henceforth uh in for better or worse like i love that and that's i might actually pick that up 
Yeah, because I, when I put on my post, I basically said this is a game that will be defined by its concept. Like, yeah, it's going to be, it, it might, it'll probably still be a fun action RPG to play. But at the end of the day, we have so many of those. But this is going to, the success will depend on how in-depth this concept will become. And what's cool about this particular title is it's actually being developed by the same team behind Life is Strange. Yes, yes. While the sequel different. has been passed off to a different team for Life is Strange. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is, in fact, a team that's very used to narrative, and they're actually getting more into narrative gameplay, which could be really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, Life is Strange was a game that definitely felt like your choices did have a, an effect. Like, you really, you really felt the weight of each choice. That's what I hear. Yeah. Once again, a game that I didn't play because it's one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's out. It's one. I would say it's one of the better, um, like interactive stories to play. Is Life is Strange. I think I have the first episode on Steam. I might actually load it it's up a, sometime soon. It's, it's free on PlayStation right now. Yeah. So, so the whole thing. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> so you might as well free. Might as well get it. That's true. Yeah. Now, as, as far as things that could have slipped under the radar, this one almost did for me, and I would have been so upset if it had, because we had the Nintendo Direct. It was a 20-minute, 25-minute thing, and it was very short. They said, hey, Metroid Prime 4 is a thing. We're making it. Cool. I was like, yes, more Metroid. I need that in my life. And then they go into the treehouse, and I'm like, I hate these treehouse motherfuckers. Like, they never know what's going on. It's always super awkward. It's always really scripted. And then, like, they sit down with Regifisime after a demo of Odyssey, I think. And um, he's like, oh, yeah, and I have a surprise for you guys. And I'm like, go on. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, this is a new 2D Metroid game. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out uh, Nintendo is remaking the Game Boy game, uh, The Return of Samus, on the 3DS, and they're calling it Samus Returns. Um Two Metroid games announced in the same show? Like, what is going on in this world? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but oh. my, uh, the biggest interest for me is that we've already technically played a remake of uh, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy because there is the excellent fan remake, another Metroid 2 remake. And it's one of my favorite Metroid games, hands down. It's made wonderfully. Like, it's really tight. It seems like the logical progression of how that game would be remade. So once this comes out in September, Samus Returns, I want to compare the two. Like, I want to sit down with, uh, I know some of the developers of AM2R on Twitter. I've talked to them pretty extensively. I want to bring them on and sit them down because they're big fans. They're pumped for this game, even though they had the big issue with the DMC takedown. And I want to sit them down and just compare, like, these are two interpretations of a game that was a big deal back on the original Game Boy. I've never been a Metroid guy. I've never been a Metroid guy. Never been a Metro guy, so I can't say much on that. Cool. <laughs> now, Zach, you like Castlevania, though, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've only played a couple, and I've only played um, like, Symphony of the Night like extensively, but I'm always a really big fan of the the whole series as a whole. You would really like the Game Boy Advance Metroid 2Ds, I think. The the two Fusion and then the remake of the first one, you would really like Zero Mission. And those are two I'd recommend for you as well, Josh, because they're a good starting point. Maybe not yeah. Fusion, because it's technically the last game in the story quote unquote but the first game metroid zero mission is an excellent remake you get everything you need to know about metroid in the really sharp um sprite style of the gba uh the only thing that's a little lacking is the music but i never found a problem with it or right. it's something that you should definitely check out on like either the uh the wii u um virtual console uh, might be on the 3ds virtual console i don't think so or right. but okay. you can emulate it All and right, it's yeah. fun oh, yeah yeah I, I know uh kurt on our site he's very excited for samus yeah, and he's not a big Metroid fan either. Like, I flip shit. <laughs> yeah. and, and, like, it's cool to see somebody who's not into it be into it. Like, that's yeah. exciting for me. One. And it was weird they didn't include that in the main, like, announcement. And I think it's Nintendo wanting to focus most of their energy on the Switch. But then also for those involved with the 3DS and all the millions of players we have on that uh, platform, they're like, hey, don't worry, guys. There's some really cool <laughs> shit coming for you, too. <laughs> Now, did you see anything Nintendo related that you're super pumped about, Josh? Like on the floor that you might have got to get your hands on? I didn't get a chance to get on the floor. That it was it was just a ridiculous. Uh, there was just it was awesome and energy, but just so packed. Because they recreated New Donk City from Odyssey, right? I believe so. I did not remember though. I'm not a really like I wasn't much into the, into the Nintendo uh, scene up there. I miss, I did miss a lot of the Nintendo stuff, so I wouldn't be able to comment too much on that. 
Now, did you get your hands on Mario plus Rabbids? No. Oh my God, that line was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, yes, uh, the whole everything in Ubisoft was just phew, ridiculously long. What an absurd concept. Yeah, <laughs> it's but uh, so absurd that it works. That could work basically. Yeah. yeah. It's weird. It almost frustrates me. Like, <laughs> why is this awesome looking? Because it, it's one of those things that, like, I've we've known about it for a long time because uh, the one journalist, Laura Kate Dale, she's been doing a lot of, like, uh, leak-related things. And she's like, oh, yeah, Mario plus Rabbids RPG. It's like XCOM for kids. It's happening. And everybody's yep. like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> you're funny. No, you're uh, funny. <laughs> and then it slowly, like, the screenshots started coming out and the artwork. And we're like, um, yeah. is this for real? There's yeah. an Instagram account for Rabid Peach. <laughs> and it's weird. It looks great. I don't mm-hmm. understand. Speaking of um, so we yeah, have Ubisoft is uh, that whole, now we're getting an RPG Assassin's Creed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Assassin's Creed looks good again. What the hell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I'm also I'm a little skeptical. I mean, great. This is why I'm looking at it. This is how my friend told me to look at it because I love Assassin's Creed. I do. I actually stopped playing though after once Unity came out. I didn't. I heard it was Uh disappointing. I didn't. I played Syndicate. wasn't a fan. But I loved Assassin's Creed growing up. Like that was that was my series. So now this is an RPG, and I'm a big RPG person myself. Now that's developed as a gamer. I'm like wondering, does it work for Assassin's Creed? Now, just maybe have to play it, not knowing it's an Assassin's Creed game. Just playing it as an Egyptian RPG. That's why I'm. That's why I'm looking at it. Basically, there's a really interesting history loop going on right now with with Assassin's Creed being a focal point. Uh, Assassin's Creed comes out, and there's two or three games, and it was really influential. We started seeing um, hub points and world maps that had a bunch of little things to do here and there. Mm-hmm. We saw towers where you could get more information, and yeah. that kind of inspired things like Horizon Zero Dawn, Shadow of War, or Shadow of Mordor. Um, mm-hmm. Even Zelda yes. has Assassin's Creed influences in it, and then we see Assassin's Creed Origins which is the origins of the assassin uh com- the the guild or whatever the brotherhood yeah and it looks like this game is taking influences from things that people have been influenced by and evolving so it looks like there's elements of horizon zero dawn zelda um the other game like there it looks like things have come full circle ubisoft has inspired people and been inspired what those people have made and are now making something similar it's yeah. weird the the one thing I'm uh, skeptical about with Assassin's Creed Origins, um, and like it is, it is an RPG, which is I I love that in games. I love leveling up. I love um, feeling like I need, I need to get better. But and I did notice this was very heavy in, in the division. If the enemy is a few levels higher than you, it's you're screwed. And I don't like the way how like how big of a impact it has just by the level. And I and I noticed in the demo that it actually does exist. If you're like facing a level enemy four levels higher than you you're going to get demolished. So that's, and I, that was then like, they're they just damaged, damage spongy. And that happened in the division as well. So now Zach, what are your thoughts on RPG yeah. balance, RPG balance or RPG balance Specific- in Assassin's Creed <laughs> specifically with Assassin's Creed in mind. I'd be really interested to see what they're doing with it. Like, cause I don't know any of the skill set for it. Like is your character naturally an assassin or is your character like, Legit, I stumbled out of my house, Joe Schmo, level one, like level zero. I'm going to go become a level one adventurer today and have to build up from there. Because mm-hmm. um, it doesn't like make sense because you're you're an assassin, right? And in all games, you just do a drop assassin, drop drop assassination, they're dead. Boom. Well, yeah. in this game, it's an RPG. And if you're an assassin and you can't kill the dude on the first jump because because you didn't do enough damage, that you're a pretty shitty assassin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I would, I would hope it's not... Okay, I stabbed this guy with my hidden blade, and you know I did one HP of damage, but you know I pierced straight through him. Like I don't yeah. want to see that because if you get the drop assassination, I think that should be your kill. Like done. Like mm-hmm. you should still have your sneak aspect, but then you should have it so like if your skill set and abilities that you can build in your RPG build around like, all right, you know I know how to run faster and be more quiet while I'm doing it. Like. If I bump an item, like, my character has a better chance of, you know, maybe doing a reflexive grab of not shattering the bowl on the ground and setting it down and moving mm-hmm. forward. Like, those kind of aspects to help improve upon the basic, like, okay, I can stab somebody and they'll die. Then that would yeah. be awesome. Mm-hmm. If it's going to be based around, okay, like, I can't fucking kill you 
with the the sneak attack hidden blade, then I'm gonna start being a little more disappointed. I, it makes sense for if you're in a fight with a sword, yeah, having to yeah. get some skill up and do more damage with it. Because even if you hit somebody with a super sharp sword, sword, and you're not doing it with the right technique, the right swing, the right gate to it, or you know applying the right pressure in it, like you might hit them and give them a cut, but you're not gonna hurt them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the stealth in games, though, yeah, I think because stealth and RPGs to me it never mixed well. Like, like, oh, I've loved that stealth section and every in the action RPG said no one ever. Yeah. No one. <laughs> Why Final does Fantasy. Final Fantasy 15 have a stealth? Yeah, exactly. Boom. He said the exact same time. <laughs> this shit makes no sense to me. And the next DLC is going to be all stealth stuff. Yeah. It's like, no, that was At not. At least you like, get an AK, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I because I, I think of like, I mean, so, rpg ness in games like uh, Far Cry and Horizon and Tomb Raider. They're not, you know, you don't level up and get better. You level up and get more skills, but you're still, everyone takes the same amount of damage as they normally right. would. So, it definitely right. looks like this Assassin's Creed is super influenced by Horizon Zero Dawn because at the yes. end of the day, if you're skilled at Horizon Zero Dawn or some of these like main action RPGs, if you have the skill, you can kind of power through being under leveled sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's that Maybe. balance that I always like. I really appreciate balance in the, in the games where I can take the skills and the tools that I have and I can creatively come up a way to uh, to get where I need to be. Kind of like Zelda. Zelda Breath of the Wild, there's a lot of different ways to approach the environment, especially if you're in like a really high level area, quote unquote. Um, you can be like, okay, well, I'm going to use my stasis thing to chuck a boulder at this guy and that's going to do shit tons of damage. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> now, that might get me by for this particular situation. Now, how how does uh, leveling up work in Zelda? Like, is it a big impact if you're facing an enemy feel that was higher than you? The biggest thing in Zelda is having um, the the armor stats, like your defense and your stamina bar increases and your hearts increase. That's it. Like, okay. Okay. everything else is based on what you find. Your your weapons have a certain damage uh, number attached to them. And then the physics has this particular algorithm it uses to calculate damage, so it's it's a lot of it's it's an interesting mix of like systems. Okay, all right. and that's what I'm looking forward to in Origins. I'm hoping it's an interesting mix of mi uh, systems instead of being that um, that gate gating, I guess you could call in RPGs. Like yeah. um, I don't know how you I don't know exactly what you call it, but like uh, the Monster Hunter part, like. You're you are that person the whole time, but as you level your gear, quote unquote, you get stronger and better through the game, because like your gear right. gives you the better defense, better attack, and that's like the quote unquote leveling system for monster. Hunting. It's not attached to an arbitrary number that your character just has innately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to see something like that put into it too, because you know, uh, at that point in the world, like I think iron in Egypt may or may not have been a thing depending on their time. You know, maybe if they'd gotten it, I don't, my time and history lines are a little messed up because I don't remember exactly when like steel was first introduced or discovered or maybe like an mm -hmm. early discovery in the game. You know, that would be a big jump up on even things that had armor items, defense, like wooden shields, like some sort of difference in this, this effect giving your level, you know, a different kind of mind, you know, four levels lower completely differently geared than your opponent giving you the upper hand even though they are clearly like more seasoned that's mm -hmm. true um uh, ubisoft definitely had a pretty good show i think as overall but yeah. as far as assassin's creed goes there was one moment in the trailer that kind of has me even more intrigued because assassin's creed has always been very history based right you know they they've got this is the date the person dies we're gonna write around this and make our character fit that situation mm -hmm. um at the towards the tail end of the i think either the gameplay trailer or the reveal trailer Cobra. for assassin's creed origin there's a giant snake yeah mm -hmm. and it looks like... like it's ripped straight out of harry potter so what sort of fantasy elements are coming into play now are we gonna see yeah. egyptian gods and shit because that'd be awesome yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. Um, i think uh... and that could relate into the story as a whole because we see those those godlike characters that visit past yeah. civilizations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and egypt was kind of a hotbed for that because a lot of people are like Hey, Egypt's got some crazy structures. Must have been aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember uh, Assassin's Creed 2 had an Easter egg uh, in it where you entered this one little area and uh, you had to do a certain movement set with, with Ezio. And I don't know where a cutscene would happen and this giant like tentacle monster would like almost hit Ezio and he had to run away from it. Yeah, the Kraken thing. Yeah, I remember that. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to see how um, Ubisoft incorporates these more fantastical elements into the game. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. Definitely, it's a step up. Like uh, it's it's something they they they, yeah, they took a year off. So I'm glad they did. Maybe Call of Duty can listen to that too. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the only I, problem I have with Assassin's Creed right now is there's like seven different ways to buy it, and one of them's eight hundred dollars. Yeah. I, no. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's literally a standard looking collector's edition with a big ass statue. I mean, it's a nice statue. I've seen photos of the statue, and it's huge. It's like two feet tall. It's big. I don't know yeah. if it's two feet tall, but it's big. <laughs> it's an eight hundred dollar purchase, and Who's like there's a that? really confusing chart of like what each version has and doesn't have, and it's just annoying. Yeah. And the thing is, they're trying they're trying to sell this with the Xbox One X, and it's like, well, if I'm gonna spend five hundred bucks on a console, I'm not gonna spend eight, another eight hundred on a freaking game. Right. I mean, even Ooh. the biggest Assassin's Creed fan, I don't think, would go that far. I mean, oh, I might. Yeah, yeah, I'm willing. I'm willing to pay for that like, kind of money, though. You could build yourself an Assassin's Creed cosplay that's out of this world. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, we we made a a bitch in like Celtic take on uh, assassins like uniforms when I was working in North Carolina acting because we had uh, yeah we worked with the natives down there and they could leather work really well. So we did this like Celtic get up to. On a as a play on an Assassin's Creed costume, mm-hmm. maybe cost us fifty bucks. It was leather and learning how to fucking stitch leather together. That's awesome. Yeah, and this costume was absolutely wearable clothes too. It wasn't like you could only wear it for this. Like you could wear it in your everyday. Uh, it was durable. Like it was completely cost effective. Yeah, and it was legit leather. It wasn't like we were using fake something here or there. It was like we bought big old leather strands because we were in a crafting village. So (laughs) they sold us all kinds of shit and taught us what we needed to do. That's amazing. But yeah, I think Ubisoft had a pretty good showing and even EA had some good points. I mean, it was all a lot of EA stuff was very corporate, um, straight laced dudes and ties. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There, there was a lot of female representation in EA with their characters, but I think the real winner of E3, if you had to declare a winner was Devolver Digital. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. They're, uh, Did you see it? I watched uh, part of it, but I just basically I got I pretty much got the gist of it as, as I watched. I'm like, this is it was watching that event is a is a terrifying slow realization that later leads to self reflection. Yeah, <laughs> it was brilliant on all avenues. And if anybody from Devolver is listening to this now, I commend you wholeheartedly because that was literally like. W- a lot of your content creators, your journalists, your your critics, we've all been kind of saying this anyways, but Devolver put it into visuals. <laughs> and yeah. it worked. It was, it was such so freaking weird, too, with the head explosion. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what did that what? come from? <laughs> there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of weird, like, acid trippy <laughs> sections. Tomorrow's yeah. unethical business practices to date. <laughs> and apparently... Earliest like- access. Like, it's the funniest thing in the world to me. Apparently, yeah, because they because they got kicked off. Apparently, like they were like they were they were they're being banned, which I I get I understand from a business standpoint. But it's like they so were in three's been against this kind of discussion. Yeah, but they were outside because I was actually outside um when I when I saw their stand and like they were pretty much outside the convention center and they had every right to be there. They were across the street, so they had oh they set up somewhere else. Yeah, E three technically had no power to say. You couldn't be here because they've always like, guess what? We can. You guys don't have access to this area, so we do. So they just set up uh, across the street. Yeah, basically. <laughs> That's amazing. That's yeah, you just fucking see this hilarious. Big uh, like logo. It was great. Because oh. I saw that it was a building, and I kind of assumed it was a different building, but I didn't know they like literally weren't allowed into E3, and they're like, fuck it, we'll have our own thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they had same every- time, same place. You're here anyways. You might as well come see us. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was America. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. I love them. Like they always do some of the like crazy over the top stuff, and a lot of their projects end up being like excellent games. I, lo- I love Devolver's games. I think uh, did they make the Call of Juarez? Was that them? Yes, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Devolver, call. I think. Hold on, let me look it up. Um, they're doing Absolver, which looks like a really cool brawler. They also did Bro Force, I'd like to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Bro they're, yeah, they're known yeah, for a lot of like pixelated, fun. stylized, really violent things. Like mm-hmm. I, I love them. <laughs> yeah, I've always loved Devolver. So, but this whole conference just like brings in that question of 
do we really enjoy E3? Is this just corporate mind control? Like, should we be applauding people who are um, ex- uh, creating pre-order culture? Like, why are we applauding the guy who comes on stage and shows us a fucking car in an event? I know, yeah. Actually, that brings me to my next point on what E3 was. There was such a tension between industry people and consumers. There was, really? Like, they... You could tell they did not want they did not want the consumers there, like. Uh, so like, your general E three crowd, your creators and your press people had a, a problem with the public coming in. Yes, uh, and I I get I understood to a point in terms of just the lines because it's we, if you wanted to wait in line like say you wanted to wait in line to play Far Cry Five you had to wait like freaking five hours in line, like your oh entire, my god it's like Comic Con yeah your entire day oh, wow. would be subject to waiting in line basically. And I get the point, but the way I look at it too, um, now, now a developer is not going to go out and say this too because they get get so much flack if they did. But like, if you, I, I said, look at it. If you don't want the consumers playing your games, what does that say about your game? That's true. Because at the end of the day, those are the people that are going to hand you cash, and exactly. they're going to be the the make or break of your business. Us exactly. press people and your content creators are going to get the word out. At the end of the day, somebody has to buy it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And we're gonna, yeah, it's like you're gonna, you're gonna give us free copies of it, <laughs> or we're press. You're gonna give us free, free review codes. So you want, you need these, these consumers to do the word of mouth advertising for you too, to say, oh my god, I played Absolver, you know, at E3, it was freaking fantastic, you know, yeah, keep an eye out for this game. Yeah, you need so, that word of mouth and people actually getting their hands on it. So I do think there should be public at E3. Like I've always thought yeah. that. Mm-hmm. I think it was a little too much, but like at the same time, like, you know, we. Because think when you have PAX, because PAX is all about the indie scene, you know. Yeah. So I definitely feel like the like, consumers should be in it, but I definitely for me, PAX felt double A. If there's a mid ground yeah. between indie and triple A, that's PAX. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that because yeah, they had a few triple A titles at PAX East. Yeah. Remember, but, yeah, Nintendo was there. I mean, there was some triple A representation, but a lot of your big surprises from PAX felt very double A. If that's yeah. a thing, I don't know. Sure, <laughs> could be a thing. Patent pending. I'm going to make it a thing. I'll put it in writing yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, it was just like, you could tell they did not want us there. And I was like, and the, the thing is, uh, they're because they're very like uh, strict on like, you know, because they know as consumers are there, certain things is like, oh, appointment only. And they're very strict on it too. They don't like, they don't like, they're not nice about it. They're like, nope, you can't come here. Like I tried getting into, uh, Andrew tried to help me get into Sony. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's like, hey, you know, go ask for this person. So I went up to like the little media section that they had. It's all press only and, you know, industry only. Went up there. Yeah. The security guy saw my consumer badge and was like, I can't let you in here. And I'm like, I'm like, I-, I was asking for a specific person. And he was just very strict on me. He's like, I'm not allowed to let you in here. Like, you have a consumer because you have a consumer badge. I'm like, oh, damn. Okay. Which is unfortunate <laughs> because I know a couple of our writers went in as consumers and ended up getting upgraded. Yeah, I then in order for me to get mine to upgrade it, it would have cost money. I'm like, I already spent freaking too much money at L- in LA. I'm That's good. true. Yeah, you've already put a lot of funds into this. Because yeah, while so. we're a small magazine, we can help you guys get into these things. We can't provide any sort of financial um, support, and yeah, that exactly. sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as much as we would like to, we can't. Like we have mm-hmm. no finances yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, but like I do think the public should be there it just i think it should have been a little more limited uh see i'm liking the fact that they're pushing more of this live stream content because that's for me where the public has always been like if you're a public member and you know that e3's fun like that's your time to kind of have the super bowl of the game industry Mm -hmm. like stay at home (laughs) make some chicken wings yeah it's crack some cold ones with the boys like let's go exactly it's a week you look forward to you know like um, that's how i've always treated it like it's always been just a big television event for me and now Mm -hmm. it's a big internet event i'm happy to be there but i don't know if i want to do it again as a consumer i think the consumer like the the amount needs to be brought down way lower and like i think there's twenty thousand people i want to say yeah, that should be like five. Let's do five thousand public, and then everybody else is industry people, and then maybe get a bigger space. Yeah, that way it just feels way more personal. I definitely felt very insignificant being there too. Like if you, like, because I mean, um, like you know, being from a smaller media outlet site, and then like, uh, especially as a consumer too, like you just felt like you just felt like a peasant there because you just yeah, you, you were the little guy in all sense of the word at that at that situation. Exactly. Yeah. So. But yeah, it was, it overall, still a great time. To, it, for me, I didn't even care about playing half the games. I just wanted to be there. 
like the, yeah. just the atmosphere meaning i got i met angry joe i got sh- i shook his hand you know um yeah, yeah you so got I to see adam sessler yeah, exactly. Yeah, I wanted to say hi to him, but like, nah, he's having dinner with some friends. I'm gonna let him be. I was hoping he'd maybe walk by us, but he didn't. So <laughs> uh, I saw Cliff Bazinski there. You know, walk past him. Oh, Cliffy's the man. He's yeah. really friendly. I haven't met him, but like everything I've yeah. talked to on Twitter and people I've talked to who knows him, they're like, oh, he's good people. <laughs> yeah, no. really passionate guy. Like he loves games. Always has. Definitely a experience. I would I'd probably have to say the most because I think I think because that's the thing too. Like I like I said, I was going as a consumer and also as media. So right. when I'm playing these games. I'm playing them because like some of them, yeah, I want to play just to play. But some of them, like you know, I want to play this so Andrew I can get something for Andrew and Alex. You know, I get I can get you guys a, a good you know write up on it. I was I was consumer and I was media. So like I wanted to play the games to get a good write up on them. But at the same time, I wanted to just play them. You know, people consumers that just want to play. It's all they want to do. And I think that that should be a they should have that because it's going to bring more success to your game or again too people worried it could it could hinder your game but that's on you but you <laughs> see i think you were in an interesting position this year because you were in that middle ground of hey i'm actually media i just didn't get approved but i'm here so yeah. maybe next year if you're approved for media and you go actually as a member of the press like you get to see that difference and i think that'll be interesting for you personally yeah yeah, yeah, I definitely will. Because uh, I also, you know, I wanted to get set up. For, you know, I wanted to get set up for Boost. You know, I tried to get into Ubisoft. I wanted to like, mm-hmm. I just like waiting freaking five hours in line. I didn't feel like that. So because you did have a couple press appointments, right? You had maybe four or five. Yeah, yeah I had a few. Yeah, and I, even one of them was for uh, seven days long gone. I was in an apartment. They had an apartment. Oh, like, that's cool. About a quarter mile away. Yeah, it was nice. It was a nice. It was a n- nice apartment too. And they even like gave me a beer and they. Walk, walk me through the game. Was anybody that hands that's, me a beer, uh, yeah. friend of mine? <laughs> that that's awesome. Um, like for me in the acting world side of stuff, like if I go to um, theatrical conventions, like tech, uh, you know, for auditions for anything like that, it's usually a giant convention center set up attached to a hotel or really nearby one. So when we mm-hmm. go do uh, like your equivalent of panels would be like workshops or like master classes uh, for that. But if you go to one and you like talk to people and you have friends, like a lot of it's networking. So, you know, your director, this guy you worked with, somebody's working with somebody and like they all want to meet, like you go out for dinner or you go over to where their company or those individuals have shop set up, which is usually their hotel rooms. Mm-hmm. And you just hang out, talk with them, do your audition in this hotel room with other people by yourself, with this person, with these people. And that's how you interact. So that's really cool to hear because I didn't know that's how uh, that was getting set up for you with your press appointments, too. Yeah, most of them were on the floor. Uh, I know Tiny Build originally was going to have me in the Marriott across the street. But then uh, when I spoke to Carrie, who works at Tiny Build, she said, oh, no, we just we got our we got the game back on the floor. Now we're just you just can just play it here. So, uh, OK, like, that's cool. Mm hmm. And it's interesting as press members that you get to make these connections and that we get to interact with the actual people behind the games, which has given me a lot more appreciation, even for some of the smaller titles that I, although I'm going to be very critical on when the time comes to do the review, like it gives me more appreciation for the industry and the people behind it. Yeah, because you see the passion for it too. Like, because that's the thing, like, yeah, like the developers, yeah. I mean, if you're a AAA game, the developers are the passionate people. You don't know, you don't know much about the publishers and how they're handling the business side of it. Because you think of EA, you think of Bioware, great developer. You think of EA as the uh, corporate Poor publisher, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, corporate commander thing. So, and I love meeting people who are making these excellent experiences and just kind of like talking to them and figure out what they were thinking whenever they were putting stuff together and just using mother the terminology and vocabulary i've developed over my 20 some years of gaming experience and just really nailing down kind of what they're getting at here and that, that's always been an interesting conversation for me i love talking to developers it's one of my favorite parts of the job hearing what like because they just they get so excited about it so and sometimes they can be like, oh, well, this is the reason I thought of this. And it could be a very personal story or, hey, I was sitting around playing Super Metroid and I thought, you know, this could be cool. And they'll turn it into whatever. And then you hear about how, much, how much time they spent on it. I would say the most like uh, the my favorite booth in terms of like just by the way they treated consumers and media was uh, Boss Key Productions for Lawbreakers. Yeah. Uh, 
they just they they absorbed every single everyone they wanted everyone to be there they didn't care if you were media or because i have appointments set up right but i still had i didn't have the media badge you know i just i still had the green highlighted you know consumer mm-hmm. badge when i would come up to them say I had an appointment they're like oh yeah come on up you know they didn't they didn't look at my badge at all and question it and they, they didn't like us. downplay you whatsoever no, you were there at all that's awesome yeah they had a great atmosphere they had us media was playing against consumers like they had like one oh, team that's that funny. on the consumers so that that was fun you know so yeah and lawbreakers was fun so i definitely enjoyed the atmosphere in terms of all the all the boosts there that one was the most accessible for everyone for me now would you say you enjoyed e3 overall then josh would you oh, do yeah. it again i would uh maybe with the media badge next time though yeah <laughs> that's about what i figured yeah because i don't but, think i could do it without a media badge yeah, it's oh, yeah. As a consumer, you just especially since you're so used to being in the industry, working in the industry, talking to people, and mm-hmm. then you get to go there and you just feel like you're just this dude. You're, you're oh, just knocked yeah. down another peg. Like I don't know. Yeah. I feel like it'd be humbling and also frustrating at the same time. <laughs> yeah, because mm-hmm. at PAX you had that media badge. You were special at PAX, you know. Yeah, even you our like little magazine like, people treated us super nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they saw the media badge. Oh, come over here. Hey, how you doing? The super no. <laughs> like, can I get you anything? I... <laughs> yeah, I made some good friends. I had some good discussions, and it was all just because I was part of something. Yeah, mm-hmm. but at PAX, everyone's everyone's part of something. So. Yeah, they treat everybody really nice, whether it's media or general people or whatever. I saw that like they were there to show their stuff and really put an emphasis on what they were doing. So that about wraps it up for E3. I mean, it's it's done. It's over with. Uh, this is a great time over the next month or so to reflect and play some games. There's still some great stuff coming out in the summer, especially from Nintendo. Arms just came out. I reviewed it. It's fun. I gave it like an eight point something. Like it, it's a good time. Splatoon's coming out soon. There's a bunch of little stuff trickling through this summer. So games are finally getting to the point that I don't feel a drought anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that used to be the case in the summer. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No, which I understood, but like, uh, yeah, I, I, I got to a point. Because all your major releases are usually in the tail end of fall, ready for the holidays, and really amping up those uh, those sales numbers, right? Now we're seeing a bit of a spread, and that's interesting to me, because some of the biggest games released this year, have are, they're already out, and they're great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they came out in, like, February, March. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got a, few to look, got a few to look forward to at the end of the year. And I got a few, like, uh, we, got, we, got, we do have a lot to look forward to next year, though, a lot, a lot of oh, yeah. announcements for, for next year. I want to like I want to chart out everything that's come out in 2017 and just like rank it and then wait for next year and do the same. Like I love the comparisons year to year. Mm -hmm. But uh, speaking of games that are out, Josh, what are you playing currently? Uh, Right now, I I was playing Victor Van. uh, Just got done with that, and uh, I'm about about to do Town of Light next to review that Mm because I I have to review it. But I actually did do it because I still had it on my PlayStation. I after I watch shadow of war i had shadow mortar still on there so i've been playing that casually nice. just just to get back into the field because i got so excited to see shadow of war like i wanted to feel it again feel the game again <laughs> right which is a title i really want to pick up um between that and the first wolfenstein or two like the the new ones coming out i want to play the first one now yeah i've only played a little bit of the first one and i just i don't remember why i didn't play more of it because i was enjoying everything about it so it's supposed to be a good game yeah. zach what have you had your teeth into um, like we were talking earlier, I uh, picked back up Destiny and have been playing it a little bit. Uh, I feel like I'm on a, a really hard relearning curve right now from all mm-hmm. the other stuff I've been playing. Like, or I just had a really like funky, like slightly laggy night. Like things weren't working well, or I'm just really bad at it again. <laughs> one uh, or the other. Yeah, one or the other. And uh, I picked back up Starbound the other day actually, and got to play with the update for like the new space travel and the mech expansion that they added to it i was watching you stream that that looks really interesting yeah the mech's really fucking hard for me to use because you're just (laughs) you're you're flying in no gravity zone so like as you're flying you like you're maintaining your momentum but you're shooting stuff stuff shooting you and flying around you at the same time and from it on or off screen and if you haven't seen that game by the way josh that's coming to ps4 soon and it's excellent is it really yeah, yeah, it's headed to PS4 eventually. Because whenever it was, like, a couple years ago, whenever I talked to them, they're like, oh, yeah, we're putting it on consoles. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Oh, wow. But uh, the new space travel in it's been really cool because they did it to where it's not you just travel planet to planet. Now you travel, like, uh, solar system to solar system, and then you 
you have to tr like literally drive like you don't drive but you tell your thing to go okay i'm in this solar system now i'm gonna go to this planet and scan it to see what's there and then you can choose to make the drop yeah then you can choose to make the drop but now they have like uh food stations like broke down space stations floating around in space that you can go to oh, outside cool. of the planets and that's where the mech comes in because you have to have it i'm gonna have to roll a new character aren't i uh that or where we were playing where we were playing we had just started building so we should just pick up there and go forward that's true yeah we should just use that multiplayer character uh, uh me personally i've been playing a lot of overwatch here recently because my buddy ben who's one of the people i really enjoy playing online games with because he's hilarious um like he uh he recently built another pc which is funny because his old pc i actually bought off him for my wife so he's back <laughs> into pc gaming again and he picked up overwatch and I, of course i had it because uh, my friend gifted it to me on my birthday last year and we played some then and now i'm kind of back into it just playing it socially like, I don't really get excited about being good or bad at Overwatch. I just find it fun to play with people. So it's a, it's a social game for me. Yeah. And then I'm also going through Persona 5, which is excellent. Everybody should play it. If you like JRPGs at all, Persona 5 is the way to go. It's got really cool characters, a really addictive combat system. Choice matters a lot. There's a lot of player choice. And then, of course, I've been playing ARMS, which is very mechanically based. Um, yeah. It's it's a fighting game. It's also kind of a uh, a shooter, rock paper scissors sort of thing. So it's it's interesting. Um, I think it's cool for Nintendo to maybe build on this in the future, like they did with Splatoon. So I really like where they're going with this uh, this new out of no out of left field ideas from Nintendo. Yeah, we need something. That's always been my biggest gripe. As as in, because like, not being a Nintendo person, to me, I was feel like we're just getting the same characters over and over again which you know they yeah they right. hold a purpose but it's the like, changes I are see, very subtle yeah i want to see something new i want to see something new fresh all the time like yeah mario kart's fun but like i like i can still i play it on the 64 all the time i can handle it i, I can be fine without a new one basically right <laughs> yeah that's that's what i've been up to um josh i would like to thank you for dropping in and hanging out with us um you're I one of my favorite it. people to work with Appreciate that. Absolutely, it was a pleasure having you, man. Thank you. You can chalk it up in your uh, your resume to first guest on the Forever Classic podcast. <laughs> that was good. The job, like boom, right there. <laughs> that that's what you do. You walk up, and you're like, "Hey, I was on this podcast. You gotta have me." <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was on the podcast. So when do I start? Basically, <laughs> that's what I need to do. Like whenever they're like, "Well, what's your work history?" I'm like, "Ah, just Google me." <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But yeah, it's been great. Um, where can we find you on the internet if we want to chat with you? Uh, you can find me uh, at JT Pedrazeth uh, on Twitter. Uh, and that's about it because I don't really go on anything else besides that and Facebook. So <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm actually, I want to get in to start the streaming gaming. I just haven't set, set anything up for that yet. If you do, I can totally help you. Between me and Zach, we've got quite a bit of stream experience and uh -huh. we can get you all taken care of and situated. Okay, yeah, I definitely want to get set up for that then. Perfect. But, uh, Zach, where can we find you? Um, uh, you know, you find me on uh, Twitter with uh, exquisite underscore liar. Uh, and then pretty much anything else, if you just ex uh, search up exquisite liar as one word, you'll definitely find me pop up in something. You can even Google that, and it's like I'm some of the top searches on that. And you can, of course, find me at Forever Classic 105 uh, with the number four on Twitter. Everywhere else, it's spelled out. In the show notes, you can find a link to our Discord channel. And I believe, Zach, we have an email address now specifically for the podcast. Yes, we, we finally have a Gmail set up for the Forever Classic Podcast at gmail.com. So if you have any questions, comments, you just want to ask us anything, ask our guests anything, shoot us an email there. Like, we'll check it, make sure that we have everything up between episodes so that we can get back to you as soon as possible. All right, guys, it's been fun for all of you at home listening to us. Once again, we thank you. We will be on other podcast platforms in the future. Right now, we're just on SoundCloud, but we'll be on other stuff later. And as always, stay cool. Music this week was Light Years Ago by our good friend, Dark. D-A-R-C. Be sure to check out his other music on SoundCloud.com. Thank you for waiting for us, and we hope you are ready for some exciting news.